Hold up, hold up. It's hard to make a difference if you don't use your voice. And that's why we need you. You. You to get out and vote. Because when we vote, we decide who speaks for us. And it's never been more important to be heard. We're all in it together. And together, 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 we make a difference. What you waiting for? AMC Networks and WeTV proud partners of the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation. Greetings, everyone. I'm Congressman Hank Johnson, representing Georgia's 4th Congressional District, where I have served for the last 13 plus years. And I'm proud to be hosting this 2020 issue forum on the topic of Black Lives Matter in the music business, too. Brothers and sisters, the legacy of slavery and Jim Crow are endemic to America, and there is no industry where that legacy has been eradicated. There's no doubt that Blacks in every facet and on every level of the music business are disadvantaged by the vestiges of racial discrimination that still permeate the industry. When you use terms like urban, we know what that means. That's code word and everybody else knows what that means too. That's why there was a backlash when country music radio refused to, pay, to play Old Town Road. You would have thought that Lil Nas had committed an act of terror against the country. The fact that urban folks are still fighting for freedom and equality in the music business and what is being done about it is what this panel of distinguished music industry insiders will discuss today. And my hope is that you, the viewers and listeners, will gain value and insight from this very timely discussion and that somehow you'll find a way to lend your support to the Black Music Action Coalition. And with that, I'm gonna kick it over to the moderator, Tia Mitchell. Thank you, Congressman Johnson. And welcome to our panel with the Black Music Action Coalition. So I want to start by introducing our panelists. First, we have Ashana Ayers, who is the founder and chief creative officer of marketing and branding company, The Ayers Agency. Her client list includes Mary J. Blige, Common, The Essence Festival. She is a trusted and effective advisor for labels and brands and prides herself on creating and producing experiences that are both culturally, culturally relevant and memorable. You can give them a wave, Ashana. <laughs> Benta Niambi Brown, a former corporate lawyer, is founder of Oma Lily Projects, an artist management and production company. She also serves as head of business affairs and at Nice Work, and that's where she led Chance the Rapper's record label and publishing operation as miniature as, as a member of his management team. Benta executive produced the forthcoming project by Tank and the Bangers and she is a strategic producing partner for the forthcoming Nelson Mandela mus musical. Welcome, Benta. Naima Cochran rose through the ranks of the music industry at groundbreaking labels like Bad Boy and Arista and legacy majors, Columbia and Epic. She helped build the careers and brand stories for, uh, for acts including Beyonce, Maxwell, Mary Mary, Juicy J, and John Legend. Now, Naima utilizes her depth of music knowledge and story crafting on a broader level as manager for Oscar-nominated artist Cynthia Erivo, a music and culture writer, and a consultant for brands, organizations, and public-facing figures. Welcome, Naima. a chief visionary officer of Young Money Entertainment and founder of Bryant Management. Cortez Tez Bryant has emerged as one of the most influential and successful businessmen in the music industry. He famously ushered his childhood best friend, Lil Wayne, to success while still keeping up with classes at Jackson State University. His job titles now include Maverick Partner, the Blue Pink Group co-CEO, and Young Money Entertainment COO with the client list that also includes Drake, Nicki Minaj, g Easy, and more. Hi, Cortez. Willie Profit Stigger serves as CEO of 5050 
music group management, a management consultant and publishing company. Brutally attacked by a police officer when he was a teenager, Prophet began serving as national youth director for Al Sharpton's National Action Network. This manager, consultant, and visionary is also the creator of Breed With Me Revolution, a nonprofit that calls for racial healing in America. He currently manages R&B singer Leighton Green and rapper Asian Doll. Hey, Prophet. All right, so those are our panelists and we're gonna get right into the discussion. So the first thing, of course, I'm gonna kick it to you, Prophet. Can you talk to us about the Black Music in Action Coalition uh, and, and how our audience should know, you know, how, why did you create this organization and what is it all about? Uh, first and foremost, I wanna thank you guys for um, having us here and using this opportunity to expose people to our mission and to our initiatives. I also wanna thank Congressman Hank Johnson for his leadership and willingness to, uh, again, use his platform to, to spread our message. Um, in the wake of George Floyd's death, uh, there was a massive reaction internationally. And we watched young people across the country express themselves in ways that we hadn't seen before, black, white, Chinese, um, across the aisle. And within the music industry, we knew that we had to use that platform and that medium as a way to really push this message. So you talked about using the platform. Benta, can you tell me more about like, how did you all come from having this idea, having these concerns to actually starting the group and, and why you decided to make it in the form that it exists today? Sure, so there were, uh, there was a handful of us uh, in the early days on Blackout Tuesday, uh, um, greatly inspired by uh, the founders of the show must be paused, uh, Brianna and Jamila, who got together um, it, it, initially, it was a short phone call. I got a call from, uh, uh, from Jeffrey Azoff, actually, uh, asking me to join in. Um, then, there, you know, like that ended up blossoming. There was so much energy and fervor and emotion uh, around what was going on. So there ended up being about 15 to 20 of us who got on the phone. We had a, a, a preliminary call uh, discussing the issues. And we said, hey, you know, there, we have an opportunity uh, to have a black led movement to really uh, to, to dig in deep and to address some of these issues. One of our concerns was that uh, in the music industry, you know, like seeing that the music industry is participating in, on Blackout Tuesday and also being deeply aware as black music executives and music industry professionals of the many ways that the music industry has been complicit in perpetuating racism, not only within our own industry, but within broader society, we said, hey, we need to do something. We need to organize ourselves around this. Uh, and so we began having a conversation with one another, putting on, putting structure. And a lot of it that first week was really just listening to one another. We listened and we listened and we listened. And then we took what we heard and we put it, in, we put it into a letter. And then from that letter, and that was a letter that we, we sent out to the industry. And from that letter, uh, we began developing a, a platform, an, an agenda uh, of items, both in the short term as well as the long term that we wanted to accomplish. So I, of course, have been reading all about um, the group. Is it BMAC by short? Is that how you all use the acronym? Okay, yeah. just making sure I was, you know. Um, so I was reading the BMAC letter and it, of course, I think was not by coincidence that it dropped right around Juneteenth and of course, as there were protests across the nation after the death of George Floyd. But what made the letter even more powerful, I would um, argue or imagine, is that so many of you guys use your, your relationships and, and you had 200 heavy hitters. And so Cortez, I saw a lot of your clients on the list. Can you talk about how you leveraged those relationships to build support in the industry as you all um, created this letter and got signers? 
Yeah, I think um, it was a, I think it was a no-brainer. I think anyone who's black and living in these times right now, um, uh, which uh, most of my clients are outside of uh, uh, G-Eazy, um, you know, they it, it resonated and hit home. So, you know, when the group came together and I relayed the message into the artists of what we were trying to do, you know, to try to help and change the systematic racism that lies in the music business. It was a no brand. It was easy conversations, you know, and they were just like, yeah, I'm down. Include me and let's go. So, Ashana, let's start getting to the real, real. You know what I mean? Like, you guys have talked about racial disparities and racism in the music industry. Can you talk a little bit more? Give me some more detail about um, the shortcomings to how Black music musicians and executives are treated and what you guys face. And then after Ashana, anyone else can jump in. Um, well, I think it's, it's clear that Black talent, Black musicians, Black culture um, drives the world. It influences the world. And what we don't see is enough of us sitting in the C and E suites making the decisions on how the dollars are being spent in our communities, on the culture, how they're reinvested. Um, and so I think that, that, that systemic racism um, shows up in that way. If we are driving conversation, if we're driving culture, if we're the driver of, of influence, we should have a seat at the table that's deciding and, and having financial, um, being able to make financial decisions on how funds are being spent, um, and so that's what we're not seeing, and that's why um, BMAC was formed. And one of the um, agenda items that we have is to make sure that we can see more of us in C and E suites because we know that we're driving the culture. And I'll I'll jump in um, to piggyback off of what the congressman said in the introduction about the use of urban for Black music. That also goes for Black executives. So what happens usually is that when you're cultivating this Black talent. Your, the black executives are assigned and we're there with the artists, with the families. We know them, we understand them, we understand where they come from, we understand who they are, we play multiple different roles. But then once they grow, they become a commodity and they get, as soon as they cross over, they're taken out of a black executive's hands and usually given to a non-black senior executive. So we're also marginalized from the process once the artists become a bigger talent, but that also means that their best interests, their best interests aren't necessarily being kept in mind because you have people working with them who are literally just looking at them as a product and not understanding who they are as a people. So, and, and to Shauna's point, it also limits our growth within the industry because we don't always get the opportunity to have our hands on those really big projects by design. And this isn't a new conversation. This has been going on since, for as long as there have been any black executives of, of in, in a real sense and black music and even, you know, we lost Andre Harrell a couple of months ago, but he was preaching this back in, you know, the nineties about how, as soon as an artist blows up, the black, the black people are no longer decision makers. So we want to make sure that the voices are there who actually understand these artist situations and who they are as people. And also that there's a pipeline to make sure that our executives can grow and move up the ladder. So you guys have mentioned, um, oh, go ahead, Benta. I just want to piggyback off of, 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 of Naima and Ashana, you know, I, and I want to be really crystal clear uh, since we have this opportunity. When, when Naima says, uh, that uh, an artist crosses over. Uh, for those who are not in our industry, what she's saying is that when an artist has value, when they have more than perceived value, but actual tangible value, that value is not something that we get to participate in continuing to create. It's a different kind of plantation system. And what I mean by that is that we're relied upon for our ideas, our ingenuity, uh, our, 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 our culture, our sense, but we're not participating in the profits. We're not participating in the revenue. We're not participating in the leadership. And as a consequence, you know, we're not able to shape things. And why does that matter? It matters because in the absence of having black leadership, it's not just the agency that we get, but if we want to, if we want to create a society where all voices are being heard, and where people understand and can relate to the black experience, then we have to have black people in positions of power. 
you know, plain and simple. Like we can't solve the American problem unless we've solved the industry problem. Can one of you all just briefly, because I think, you know, if you're like me and you're not in the industry, we see so many of the forward facing people, particularly early in an artist's career, they look black. So it gives the, the appearance that black people are the managers and are the decision makers. But it sounds like you guys are saying at those upper levels, it's not very diverse at all. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in here. I mean, when you went, as I said, we're driving the culture, right? And so, you know, when you have black music uh, bringing in the dollars for the record companies, but the head of the black music departments are white, that is a problem. When, you know, to speak to Naima's point, we are at the ground level developing the talent. We're telling them how to walk, talk, dress, what to say, what not to say, how to, how to, um, how to nurture and develop them. But, uh, but the people who are in charge, who control the budgets, who um, control the timelines, who control the release schedules, they are not of color. They don't get why Juneteenth is important. They don't get why um, cer certain moments in our culture and our community are important. So, um, so again, we're, we're, we're doing the work at a ground level, but never really seeing um, those corner offices. But Tia, you know, to, to all, the, all of their points, this is nothing new, right? This is, the, this is the same narrative that Black people experience in society, right? So the same racism that drives American culture and American society, rather, is what drives and lives within the music business. So it was important for us, and particularly when the industry said that they were willing to stand with their Black employees in solidarity and said that Black lives matter, it was important to us that we actually held them accountable to those statements. And if Black lives truly mattered, then make sure you invested in Black executives, make sure you're invested in Black talent, making sure that you're paying Black artists the same way you pay white artists, making sure that Black artists don't have to start at Urban Radio and then hopefully move to pop. If, if, we, if we're really truly sincere about that statement, then we need to dismantle the system that says and suggests something different, as in America. Yeah, and, and so there's... Go ahead, one thing I'd love to add on to what Prophet just said is that, and to be clear, you know, like, it's, it's, and it's not just black managers and black executives overseeing black music, you know, like the, 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 presum the presumption that if you have dark skin or are a black person and that you don't also have interest in country music, uh, to the congressman's point, that you're not also, that you can't be classically trained, that you're not into punk. Punk is black, by the way, you know, like that you're not into rock, that you can't be, that you can't develop a marketing plan and bring an artist to, to, to market who's in any of these other genres, whether they be white or black, you know, like, like, like it, 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 the, the, and, and excuse me for being very frank, but like the idea, like the ghettoization doesn't help either because we are a creative and beautiful and magnificent and thoughtful people. You know, like if Ashana Ayers can market this kind of artist, then I know that she can market that kind of artist, you know. Right. I'll give you a brief descriptive example. Um, I was the vice president of marketing at a major label and we had a superstar pot release and I would be called in for taste and tone. That's what they literally called it. I was called into every meeting. I was a part of every decision. Um, who should be the photographer? Who should direct the video? What single are we going with? I was a part of every conversation, but I was not given that artist to to direct. I wasn't in control of the budget. I didn't have any real power, but I was a part of every decision and conversation related to taste and tone with this pop artist. I just want to, it's like what the congressman said at the beginning, and this is, I think, essential to why BMAC exists. There is no industry that isn't hit by systematic racism. So in the music industry, it doesn't just look like who's making decisions for the artist or how how laterally or upwardly or broadly executives can move. It also looks like black retailers not getting the same deal as big box retailers. It also looks like black promoters not being able to get in the same venues as white promoters. It looks like black agents, booking agents, not getting the same clients because they believe that the white booking agents can do a better job. The same thing with attorneys, the same thing with every other entity that surrounds the music industry ecosystem. So it really is a matter of who is making decisions about our dollars because our artists right now, Urban is the dominant 
um, you know, music genre in the world, which really means hip hop. But again, there are, we're not at the top. Like, yes, you see us around artists, but that's their people. Those aren't necessarily decision makers. Those are the people they trust who stay with them, keep stay close to them. But on the flip side, on the business side behind the desks, that's not necessarily who's representing them. And again, it's really hard sometimes to fight to try to explain to somebody why something is going to jeopardize an artist's career or why something is tasteless or why something is just off note or why something is actually offensive and, and you know but they're all just looking at it in terms of analytics and in terms of what's hot and again not really understanding the artist as a person and also not valuing the irony is that black people actually probably have a larger awareness of pop culture all the way around than anybody because we have to be exposed to everything we have to know our stuff and we have to know mainstream stuff so the fact that we get marginalized to urban music but everybody else in the office can work hip-hop Absolutely. You know, it's it's it, the irony is is striking. But this is again, it's always been the case. So let me ask you guys. You guys sent this letter in um, at the end of June, and I know in the letter you said you wanted to have some meetings in the first thirty days. Um, Profit or Benta, can you talk about how the letter was received, and and do you think they're they're you know, are they, was it embraced by the labels yeah, and the, and yeah, those I, industry giants? I jumped, I took a little piece of it and definitely then pass it to Benta. Um, yes, the, the letter has been received extremely well by um, everyone that, that we have asked to, um, to meet with. Um, one of the things that we're very encouraged by are the task force that's been developed within the music business at these various companies. Um, we believe that the task force are important, that the work that they're doing is extremely valuable to, the, to, to this conversation, and they have agendas that were extremely aligned with the agenda that DMAC uh, established. So we, we want to make sure that we supported that uh, from the outside and that the artists that we represent support that to ensure that the changes that they want to see happen within their buildings actually happen this time. Um, and then it wasn't just the music companies. We actually met with with DSPs and we met with publishers and we met with agents. So um, all of them have on some level agreed to work with us uh, in some capacity. And Vincent can kind of further uh, describe the relationships. Yeah, I mean, I, I've been, we've been as a whole deeply encouraged by the response. Um, you know, there, there's a, a sense that they know, they know that there are things haven't been right. Um, there are some people who, you know, as recently as yesterday, we were speaking with a couple of executives who said to us point blank, like, we've needed to have an organization like BMAC because there are things we've actually been trying to get done, and this is helping us to do it. And so BMAC is, is providing uh, executives who care and who are in tune with these issues uh, with the cover and the support they need so that we can create a more just, more fit, fair uh, music uh, music uh, business. Um, you know, like whether it's around election and voting, whether it's around uh, uh, raising uh, funds uh, to support various initiatives that will put money directly into the Black community to help bolster Black creatives, whether it's around our conversations uh, for integrating executive training programs or developing in, uh, integrated in, uh, internship programs, funded internship programs, so that young black folks who don't have the ability to work for free. And as you know, I love college. I love the academic system. I'm, I'm a lawyer by training, you know, but the, but, but getting course credit is still working for free. Right. If you, if you need to pay the rent, you know, if you have bills that you've got to pay. Right. So, um, so, so, so there's been extraordinary receptivity and there's been a really good give and take where, you know, some of the executives are saying to us, well, what do you think about, this idea, what do you think about this idea? Um, and, and so like they're, they're riffing with us and we're expanding what we think is possible based on some of the feedback we're getting. So, you know, by and large, you know, like the reception has been incredible. It's deeply encouraging. And, you know, our, our job as BMAC and the founders of BMAC and as an organization is to continue to hold folks feet to the fire uh, to make sure that we are not doing this necessarily in a way where we're prosecuting them or putting them on trial, uh, but that we're partnering with them truly and genuinely. And that's the conversation that we've been having, is that this is partnership, 
this is collaboration, this is all of us working together uh, because we recognize that there's a problem. And it's making sure that this isn't just uh, you know, a moment, you know, like it's understanding that this is a movement, a long-term movement, and that we're gonna continue coming back to one another, you know, like at least once a quarter, if not more often, uh, until, you know, until we have change. And even once we have the change that we need to see, um, we're gonna keep doing it because we as black folks need to adopt the perspective of never again. This can't be, this isn't acceptable to us any longer. Uh, and we need to have courage in that uh, and not be afraid of saying, stating that loudly and clearly. Um, last thing that I'll say on this, and then you know, I wanna pass the mic on, uh, is that it, it, you know, particularly at the companies where there are senior uh, black executives, there has been great response and receptivity. It shows the importance of not just having an inclusive leadership, uh, not just having a diverse leadership, but having an integrated leadership. Because these are folks and these are decision makers who um, got into their positions because they're damn good at what they do, number one. Um, and it's indisputable that they're good at what they do. They have currency and they have weight. Uh, they're truly integrated uh, into their companies. And it's the model of what we should be going for, you know, across our business and throughout society. It's not just, you know, we need to have a black person here or we need to have a black person there. We need to have people who are integrated and who are being listened to, who are being heard. Um, and so that's been extremely helpful as well because their leadership is undeniable and it needs to be pointed out uh, and underscored uh, what a great job these folks are doing. So and Cortez- we're not, we're, oh. not, we're not confused and, and, we're not, and, we're not, and we're not overly optimistic in, in, in thinking that things are gonna happen tomorrow. But what we are clear about is that things will change that this is not that generation that's just going to allow the conversations that happen and then not actually change the uh, uh, transfer that, 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 that power, that passion, uh, uh, that protest into, into policy. Um, because if we don't leave here understanding things differently, I mean, not understand them differently, but ensuring that things are different for the next generation, then we have missed it, right? We, we just got caught up in the actual moment. The goal is to ensure that policy changes take place. Uh, within the system. And Cortez, I want to ask a question that I want to use as a bridge as we shift to some of your you guys' work that starts looking outside the industry. But the bridge question for me is, um, in talking to you guys, you guys br brought up how because of systemic racism within the music industry, it not only affects the artists, but it affects their families. It, ex it affects their ability to build generational wealth. And you've worked with some super successful artists. Can you help? Again, I think people like me don't, we think all the, the people we see on TV are rich, you know, but can you talk about that and, and why Black artists have it harder in, in making money from the industry? Um, absolutely. I think that uh, to start, you know, I was lucky enough and privileged enough to come on, underneath uh, uh, Cash Money Records, Baby and Slim, who entered the game as independent, um, as independent label owners, and uh, who just used the label for distribution and basically like a money bag, but uh, retain their independence. So my thought process in my building has always been that. So I've always been in a leadership controlling the dollars and and my artists' careers from the beginning, you know. But that didn't blind me to everything else that was going on in the business. And I think that, you know, uh, something that needs to be addressed and that comes with the artists, uh, uh, why these artists can't establish the wealth that, that you know, the counterparts may have, but, you know, it's exposure, education, and, and it's these slave deals that's existed in the music business since the beginning. You know, it's not fair, you know, it's not fair. I think that they're doing a jo uh, job now uh, within recent years of, uh, um, of having more collaborative deals where artists actually retain ownership of their music. I think the only reason why that's happening is because of the digital uh, uh, age and, and artists have other options to really distribute their music on their own. So they've been forced, they've been forced at this point to um, um, try to uh, give these artists some better 
deals. But I think that that's been a problem in history. You know, you look at the Temptations when they drop a Cadillac and a gold chain off, and and play on to our, you know, play on to these poor people, which most artists were, and coming from out out of our sector, um, and 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 play into that, you know, and wave the shiny things in front of their face. And and it's a lot because there's a lack of education and ignorance. But I think that now, and I think that groups like us and what we're doing. Uh, we can help change that narrative and 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 help these artists become educated on the type of independence they should have, how to use their leverage in order for them for them to retain certain rights and and make that money off of their product for the rest of their lives. Okay, so <clears throat> we've talked about in the industry, we've talked about the systemic racism. You guys are taking your again these awesome connections you have in this work and you're applying it to the wider questions that are before us you know nationwide so um ashana can you talk about you know this part of bmac that is about mobilizing the industry to address some of the larger questions that that everyone's talking about um sure um so I'd say our board and our executive leadership um, council is made up of some of uh, the most dynamic, smart, successful executives in the business. And they represent some of the most influential talent globally in the business. So I think understanding that, and like everyone said before, being so affected by what we've seen um, recently, George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, I think, like Cortez said, you can't not acknowledge that you have to do something. And I think that we've all said, how do we use our collective influence, our strategies, our platforms, and really our artists. Our artists have been a big part of pushing us to say, what are we doing? Um, and so with that, we've identified not just uh, areas within the music business, but um, you know, we have an election that's probably the most important election in our lives that we have to help to affect. We have, um, you know, criminal justice reform. We have policing. There's so many things that we know um, that, again, between our collective resources, influence, understanding of strategy and how to galvanize our communities that we just have to do. Um, I think it's really just that simple that there's, you know, there's, there's no other option. We have to, we have to protect us and we have to um, protect the lives and the futures of, um, you know, our families to come. And Naima, I know that you guys have talked about voter suppression efforts. Can you talk a little bit about um, what that work looks like? I'm going to actually kick that to profit um, to start with, because this is, this is his passion area. Uh, yeah, I, I take a piece of it, then pass it to Benta. Uh, we, we all have been working collectively on this. Um, but we understand that, that, that the artist's voice is the voice that's going to really send out a message in a way that nothing else, no one else can. So we want to be able to make sure that we understand how to vote, that there are alternatives to just standing in line in November early voting practices, um, developing a plan, which is key. So we're working with a handful of artists to make sure that we tell that story in a very simplistic way, in a very inspiring way, in a way that people understand that, it's, that, the, that the frustrations that they felt um, after George Floyd in the wake of Breonna, that frustration, that anger that they felt has to translate to policy. Like it means nothing to go out there and protest and, 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 and kick in doors and kick in, um, it, it means nothing if at the end of the day, we don't get a Voters' Rights Act out of it. We don't get a policy change out of it. When, when our ancestors did this, they did it with the intention, that, with a very deliberate intention that this would lead to policy change. So we have to, as a, as a, as a generation and as, and as leaders and influencers, uh, preach this message and send this message that we have to use this power this time at the, at the rolling booth. And there's going to be so many tricks that's being used this time because we're dealing with COVID, because we're dealing with 
a variety of other issues, um, we have to be clever, smart, and deliberate about our plan to vote this season. So we are putting together uh, various campaigns with artists uh, to make sure that that message is thrown out there. And then to, there's some other programs we're working on, I'm sure you can speak to. Uh, sure, thanks, Prophet. Um, you know, and look, we, we are, we're greatly inspired by the civil rights leaders who've come before us. Uh, and and, and uh, in particular, uh, uh, Congressman, well, Congressman Johnson, of course, uh, but Congressman Lewis. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, it's, it's not shocking to us in a way, if you think about it in, in strictly biblical terms, that a man who was a saint, uh, who endured the scourgings, uh, and who evidenced the greatest of moral courage, passed away just as this new ascended, if you will, just as this new movement has been given life, uh, making all of us, I think, apostles of justice, if you will. And so in being an apostle of justice uh, and, and, and being folks who care passionately about this, we wanna make sure that we do everything to protect that sacred right. You know, we understand when we talk to your, our, the young fans of our artists uh, and when we talk to our young artists too, for that matter, we understand that there is a disconnect uh, for them that some of us don't have generationally because many of us grew up right and right as the civil rights the the the, the civil rights movement was 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 beginning to, to end um and and so we saw it we experienced it we felt it and so we have a job to do in educating young folks and helping people to understand that this isn't just this isn't just about uh you know voting to perpetuate a system this is about voting to challenge a system. This is about the expression of our humanity. You know, if you care about black life and black dignity, then you can't silence your voice. And there are so many different ways of articulating a voice. And one of those ways of articulating a voice is at the voting booth. And not only that, we also wanna be in a position where we are creating opportunities for people to see the fun and the joy in voting. I knew the fun and the joy in voting because as a little girl, you know, my, I would go with my parents to the voting booth. We would all get dressed up. It was an event. You know, I had some kind of red, white, and blue patriotic outfit on. I still do it. I'll still do it when I do my absentee ballot this year. Um, like, for real. I'll take pictures. I'll send it to y'all. Um, and, and so what we want to do is not just make sure that people have a plan that they're voting and that they're voting early, but that for those folks who are showing up to the polls um, and, and will show up to the polls because they – for whatever reason, they've been spooked uh, by, by, by rumors that, um, uh, that, that, that vote by mail isn't going to work or won't be effective, and they're, they're concerned that their vote isn't going to count. Um, we want to do everything that we can to have voter protection efforts on the ground. I don't want to necessarily go into the specific details just now, but voter protection efforts on the ground where we're encouraging, you know, we're encouraging everybody in our industry to take the day off, to use it as a day of service, to sign up as poll watchers, uh, to, to make sure that the polls can stay open all around the country in every district, that there, there's no poll that has to close because the elderly folks who normally work at the polls uh, are, 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 are too vulnerable to COVID. Um, and then we also wanna do everything we possibly can to help people get to the polls, uh, to turn out that vote on election day, uh, particularly in the cases of folks who, are, who, aren't, who don't trust uh, that the, 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 the Postal Service will work for them. Um, we don't want anybody to be disenfranchised in any way, shape, or form because disenfranchisement, you know, just going back to what I was saying before, disenfranchisement is, is another form of human degradation. It is another shot at our humanity. And so to be a fully realized human being, we know we have to vote and express ourselves, not just this year, but every year, and whenever there's an opportunity to do it. You know, ben, I, I have to say one thing. Venture just tapped on something that was just extremely powerful for me. And I just want to make this statement. You know, how beautiful Black people are. Um, the hell that we have gone through in this country, we still believe in the promise of this country. Um, that's just amazing to me. You know, that, that even in this time, you have Black people who are working overtime to try and fight systemic racism within the music industry. Um, there's no one getting paid for this. This is not a, uh, a bonus. You know, uh, folks are vacationing. People are in the mountains chilling. People are 
in their summer homes uh, staying safe from COVID and the black people who still believe in the promise of this country is here in the good people who, who refuse to stand on the sidelines and be silent. Understand this. And it's just, a, it's just, a, it's just it's amazing to me, just the beauty of black people. I mean, amidst yeah. all of this, we are still finding in our power to get dressed up on election day and really feel that it's still our, our job to fight for this because we still believe it's possible. I mean, with all that we have gone through over 400 years in this country, I mean, you can't top the, 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 the genius in, 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 that, in, that, in that, that special thing that black folk have. So I just wanted to say that. I know um, the Congressman is about to close, but I just wanna, if I could piggyback on one thing that, the, that both Prophet and Vincent just said, um, like like Benson said, we realize that there's a disconnect with our with our with our artists fans and with and with younger voters. There's an apathy there. There's a feeling of why should we be engaged? It doesn't matter. And the the method of simply telling them about our experience, like Benta saying she got dressed up to go to the polls, but her parents, me talking about how my great grandmother, even in her 90s, made sure somebody drove her to the polls. That doesn't that doesn't click with them. It feels like we're just telling them we should do it just because it's the way it always has been done. And they have not seen evidence that that is good enough of a reason. So the other thing that we want to make sure that we're doing is learning how to message and educate them as to why this is important in language that resonates with them. And because we do have the, the, the influence and the relationships and the resources through these talents that we work with, through the people, through other young people who work with us um, to actually have those conversations, get that dialogue, get that exchange, you know, learn in real time, course correct, and, and find a way to connect with them on their level instead of trying to get young voters to connect with us on our level. Well, we have just a few minutes left. So what I want you guys to do is tell the folks watching how they can find you guys. You're, you know, I know that there's a BMAC website and how can they get involved whether they're in the industry or not in the industry? Yeah, um, we, we are, you can definitely, you can definitely uh, log on to our website, which is bmacoalition.org, bmac.org. Um, uh, you can definitely sign our letter. Uh, we will have by the time this, we will have uh, committees that you can join. And so this can be, you can be an active participant in this change and, um, and actively participate with, with BMAC as we um, galvanize uh, artists and, and, and like-minded people around this issue, around these issues rather. Yeah, and, and BMAC is for everyone. Uh, yeah. You know, like we, we, we are artists, uh, producers, engineers, uh, managers, executives, lawyers, business managers, that's true. But it's for everyone, regardless of their racial background, gender. Like, there's no. It's not. We're, we're called the Black Music Action Coalition, but this is a. This is an open tent. It's for everyone who cares passionately about eradicating, er, eradicating, uh, eradicating racism within the music business and within broader society. Um, and so we're not. We're, we're not turning away support from anybody. We're not. You know, like this isn't some exclusive club. Uh, this is about people who care about the future of America and the future of our business. Um, so it, it's pretty easy to sign up. Our handle on social media is uh, BMA underscore coalition. Uh, and that's for Twitter as well as for uh, uh, Instagram. And we welcome everybody uh, to, to come and, and join us. And is there room for non-music industry folks, whether it's, are you guys raising money? Yeah. Um, elevating your message? We also have the uh, Black Music Action Charity, which is our uh, nonprofit 501c3 arm. And there's going to be a variety of things happening from within that. But yes, this is about expanding to the community. We want the people that, that not just um, buy music, but people understand that they can actually participate in this organization's mission to help change this industry. So we want people who are the consumers of the music to actively be involved with us as well, because it's that voice that we're using. It's that collective voice that we're representing ultimately. And is there, Naima, is there anything, you know, we've talked a lot about racism in the music industry. We talked a lot about the need to 
um, empower and elevate Black voices in the music industry. Is there anything people at home can do to kind of encourage the record labels and the streaming companies to hear your message? How can we, you know, the folks who want to support your message, how can they help let the labels and the companies know that, you know, you guys have support? I, I, I'm glad you asked that, Tia, because I think what happens sometimes is that consumers react to the artists instead of reacting to the decision makers. And when, as, as you guys are visiting uh, BMAC's site, and you're seeing our initiatives and you're seeing what our action steps are going to be, feel free to actually do some research and find out who heads these companies up because they're very invisible to people outside of the record business. Like to your point earlier of who you see around artists, with their, almost every major label head save like three could walk down the street and nobody would know who they are. We know who they are, right? So I would encourage um, consumers who are concerned about what they see, the business practices they see to find out who has these companies that, that you have issue with? Don't, don't attack the most visible people. They're usually the lowest on the totem pole. But find out who the decision makers are. Send your, the same way we would do for policy change, it's the same thing that we need to do inside of companies. Find out who the decision makers are. Send your communications their way. At, well, a lot of them aren't active on socials. But tweet them, at them, write them letters, talk about them, and, and just make your allegiance and, and your desires for change heard publicly, but direct it towards the right people. Any other parting thoughts? Well, I, that means we covered it all. And I want to thank our panel. We have Willie Prophet Stiggers. We have Benta Niambi Brown, Cortez Tez Bryant, Naima Cochran, and Ashana Ayers. Thank you so much. And I want to thank all of uh, y'all for being on this panel today. Uh, Prophet Ashwana, Naima, Cortez, plus our moderator, Tia Mitchell, who has done an excellent job. And I also want to give a big shout out to my friend, Dina Lapote, attorney extraordinaire in Los Angeles, California, who wrote the Modern Music Modernization Act, which passed uh, the House and the Senate and was signed into law a few years ago, she wrote the bill and I met her uh, through her work on that uh, bill. And I, she is the person who connected uh, Profit with me. And Profit uh, turns out to be uh, living right around the corner from me. So uh, we're, we're looking to kick it big time as soon as we get out of this uh, COVID-19 pandemic and are able to uh, socially uh, uh, be around each other. And I also want to um, say that this was a vital and much needed conversation. And before um, we, um, before we part, I want to uh, just let everybody know that, you know, along with physically building this country, we also uh, built the culture. While other folks were sitting on the, on the uh, porch drinking iced tea, we were working hard and we were also singing and we did a little dancing. And as recordings uh, began to take shape, you know, people used to listen to what we were doing and we've always led this culture in America. And unfortunately, just like our labor, our intellectual property, our cultural work has been appropriated, exploited and monetized. And we've been denied our fair share of the enterprise. And this exploitation continues in all facets and on all levels of the music industry. And this vestige of Jim Crow racism is what the Black Music Action Coalition was formed to address. I am uh, so happy to highlight on this issue forum for the 2020 Annual Legislative Conference of the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation. I'm proud to highlight uh, this issue and uh, I want to leave you with this. The Black Music Action Coalition on its website says that this plan must include a review that specifically examines inequities in the treatment of Black artists, the recruitment, advancement, and salary parity of Black executives, and a general analysis of how each company in the business will make things right 
by black artists, executives, and the greater community. So we support your efforts here in Congress, the Congressional Black Caucus. And also I'm hopeful that the people on the street will have your back. If you ever need to call upon us, if there should be any backlash to your efforts, and we know that when you get into good trouble, it causes you sometimes to have trouble. So if you need us, know that we're there, we have your back, and thank everybody so much for listening. And with that, as we say in Congress, I yield back. Thank you.